Okay, well, it's time to start. Okay, so and I apologize for all the continuing confusion about where and when the class is going to be and everything. I hope from now on it's going to be normal. Um, and as usual, I'm going to start with where we are in the book. Uh, Right, so the doctrine of elements had two parts, the transcendental aesthetic and the transcendental logic. And the transcendental logic has two parts, and the transcendental analytic is what we've been spending most of our time on so far. We're getting close to the end of it, although not at the end of it yet. Um, and it had two parts, the um, analytical concepts analytical principles and the analytical principles have three parts schematism system of principles And phenomena and noumena, which was the reading for today. Um, and so this would be the end of the transcendental analytic, except that phenomena and noumena has this long appendix. Um, called On the Amphiboly of the Pure Concepts of Reflection. Really know that the amphibole. So, uh, um, and I think it's pretty clear that it's an appendix to this. I mean, some people, some I've seen people call it an appendix to the entire transcendental analytic or an appendix to the analytical principles. So it's a little hard to tell because the first two editions. So the first edition has a table of contents, the contents, the A edition but it's not very detailed. It doesn't go down to this level of detail. So, and the second edition doesn't have a table of contents at all. Somehow it was left out. <laughs> so, but if you look in the third edition, I think you'll see it's pretty clearly marked. This is an appendix. All right. Anyway, not talking, that's, that's the reading for next time. Um, so, Okay, so I'm going to talk, uh, I mean, I said before that it's pretty easy to understand why we need these two parts, and that this, but that this part is kind of unexpected. Um, so I'm going to try to explain why I think it's there, um, uh, in addition to what it says. <laughs> Um, but before that, since I never got to say anything about the argument of the second analogy last time, I'm going to perhaps unwisely spend a little bit of time talking about that. So, um, right. So the second analogy is in the system of principles, remember. And I'm not going to write up the whole structure of the system of principles again, but, um, but, uh, I, you know, I ran out of time last time and I, I didn't even realize I was running out of time. So I didn't get to say anything about how it works. So I'm gonna say a little bit. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna this. Okay, so um, so this is, I'm not gonna talk about the text in, in detail. Uh, I mean, that would take too long, but this is like a general way to understand what's going on in the second analogy. Um, and I think you can start with this. Now, I actually, I started thinking about it this way when I was teaching 144 and I was teaching Hobbes. And so, um, for Hobbes' political philosophy, of course, it's very important for him to explain um, how it is that we come to expect certain consequences from doing certain things. 
right? Like that's what's going to hold the Commonwealth together that people are going to expect to get punished if they violate the law or whatever, right? So, and, it, and um, therefore he explains that in terms of his psychology and he says, well, you know, if A is followed by B lots of times, then uh, we come, so like, we've seen this over and over, and now we just get A. And because we've seen this over and over, we expect, we expect B, we associate A with B. So like the mind, the imagination supplies B. So, um, and I mean, obviously to talk about why you expect things to happen in a commonwealth and other, it's gonna be much more complicated than this, but this is the basic mechanism. And so like, I asked myself, hold on a second. Like, I understand what it is to associate A with B. Whenever I think of A, I think of B. But what does it mean to expect B? Right, like why, why, how is this different from when I get a, I think that B must have already happened. Or when I get a, I think B must be happening somewhere else. <laughs> so, I mean, of course you could say, well, A comes first and then, the imagination supplies B. That is, we represent B after we represent A. But that's not enough, right? Because that would be true in those other cases too. Right, so like suppose instead of this, that my experience was Now the same thing is going to happen when I get A, the imagination is going to supply B and I'm going to represent B after I represent A. But that's not enough. I have to represent B as after A. <laughs> um, so, and like, so here's one way you might think it works. You might think that uh, when we imagine something, we imagine it with a little time in this, right? You know, and so like to expect B when I get A means that I expect B to come, that when I perceive A with time equals one, I imagine B with time equals two. Um, but first of all, we don't really get these little timestamps on our things we imagine, right? Uh, um, uh, but suppose we did, right? Like suppose that, you know, I don't know, like maybe the Terminator has this, right? Like in every, uh, picture, there's also a little time at the bottom left or right or something, right? <laughs> um, but, you know, whatever occurs in some order in time could occur in the, in the opposite order too. Right, so like if I could perceive this and then this, I could also perceive this and then this. That is, uh, these timestamps don't actually work. <laughs> There's no reason the timestamps couldn't come in the other order. So, um, so this is basically what Kant is getting at when he keeps saying time itself is not perceived. Right, like not only aren't there these little timestamps, but there couldn't be, they wouldn't work, right? Now, I mean, 
So why wouldn't they work? Well, in other words, why is it that things, if things could occur in this order in time, they could occur in this order in time? Well, every time is just the same as every other time, right? Time is homogeneous. I mean, I don't know if that's really true, but that's what Hobbes thinks, and that's what the Hobbes thinks, and Hobbes thinks, and whatever, right? Every time is the same as every other time. So, like, there can't be something about the time that doesn't allow a certain context, right? Like, there can't be something about a certain time that only allows this time stamp and not this time stamp. And therefore, there can't be timestamps. <laughs> um, so, uh, um, now, I mean, of course, if you think of what Kant takes himself to approve time is in the transcendental aesthetic, then this becomes even clearer, right? That is, I mean, the form of inner sense has to be homogeneous this way, because the pure form of inner sense is the formal character that every inner intuition has in common, right? So it's like automatically homogeneous in this sense. Um, so, and I mean, you, and so like, but I think this is another way of saying the same thing. From Kant's point of view, you can say, time itself can't be perceived because time isn't an object of perception. Time is our faculty of inner sense itself. <laughs> right. So, um, so where does the time direction come from? Now, I mean, like Kant is usually talking about perception, not, um, um, but as he points out, perception of like connections always involves imagination. Right? That is, you're always connecting what's present to something that's not present. And the faculty of representing something in intuition, even without its presence, is imagination. So, um, So, like, if you see a boat going down the stream, um, that may involve one perception of where the boat is right now, but the rest of it is all imagination. And so, right, so the, the, the question, the basic question is this one, how can the imagination represent something as after something else? So I think the answer is the time direction has to come from the concept that the imagination is trying to supply an image. That's Kant's answer. Um, to C, oh, C209, I think I meant Kemp Smith 209. Yeah, so that's what he means. This is B219, um, and it's page 209 in Kemp Smith. And this is part of the like initial paragraphs that he added to the proof of the second analogy in the B edition. Um, Since time, however, cannot itself be perceived, the determination, now again, I'm not sure exactly what sense he's using the word determination here, but the determination of the existence of objects in time can take place only through their relation in time in general, and therefore only through concepts that connect them a priori. So that sentence is, is hard to understand, um, but I, I do understand this much from it, that it's the, the, um, the sequence of objects in the imagination has to be, um, 
there has to be a concept for there to be a rep for the imagination to represent things as one after another. So, like, I mean, if you think about the example, Kant's example of the house. So, like, so you know, I can perceive the roof and then the foundation, or the other way around, or the left and then the right, or the right and then the left. Now, I mean, those different scenarios, are, in those different scenarios, there are different events that that happen in different orders, right? Like, here's me seeing this part and then this part. So this is me seeing it as an event and me seeing that as different events. And if it's in the other order, these events are in the other order. But um, those events have nothing to do with what makes this a house. Right? So it's the concept house that's determining what counts as before and after. Right? Like the roof isn't after the floor because. Um, uh, this relationship to me is not part of what makes it the floor of a house. We had another concept like uh, like um, house, like home inspection or something, <laughs> right? <laughs> then, um, then using that concept, we would find that there's an order to these events. Um, so, uh, um, so it's like, I don't know if this is going to help to anyone, but it's almost like the opposite of what Hume thinks happens, or Hobbes, probably. Well, Hobbes doesn't go into as much detail, but like Hume thinks that from observing this succession over and over, um, the um, the imagination starts to expect expect things in this order. And because of that, the order starts to seem necessary to us. And that's where our concept of necessity and power and whatever our idea in Hume's terminology comes from, such as they are, right? But Kant is saying that, on the contrary, it's, it's only because we represent, our concept represented some necessary succession of the object. Um, that the imagination was ever able to represent one thing as being after another. And um, every empirical concept has to represent a necessary um, succession in its object. Um, and, you know, like that, why does it have to? Well, I mean, that would be the metaphysical deduction of the category of cause and effect, right? So, I mean, but it's roughly speaking because like uh, for the, so like to have a concept cinnabar, I have to be able to represent, I have to be able to use the concept in hypothetical judgments, like, if X is Y, then cinnabar is Z or something like that, right? So I have to be able to represent cinnabar's state as depending on external conditions. By external meaning external to the def to the concept of cinnabar, right? Not necessarily external to the space the cinnabar is in, but ex right, like not non-cinnabar conditions. Normally, it will be outside the cinema, though. It's not always, right? But um, this is, you know, well, I don't, I'm not going to go into that part. Um, um, so,
so uh, so because this, the concept always requires something like that in its object, right? So that the concept always requires that the object, so the object of the concept is a substance. So like the concept, you know, is that always true that the object of the concept is a substance? That can't always be true, right? The object of the concept is either a substance or an accent. That right? That's the that's the first thing. Um, but let's say it's a substance. I think if you have an accent, then you kind of just switch everything around. So, um, so every empirical concept represents its object. So here's the concept. It represents it represents its object as changing from A to B based on the state of some other substance. This substance is the cause, and um, this this condition of the cause that allows it to act is kind of called its causality. But never mind that. So this this substance here is the cause, and the effect is the change from A to B. Um, and the concept represents its object as changing from A to B under this influence, and not from B to A, right? So like the both accelerate towards the center of the earth, not away from the center of the earth. Right, so, um, um, and because the concept demands an order, the concept creates an expectation of an order of representations. Um, now, like, um, forget for a moment how that works. <laughs> the, but the um, uh, but the point is for something to conform to this concept, it must change in this order. And so you know, like when I look at something and try to determine whether it's cinnabar, I see whether it follows the right order or not. So, um, and, you know, like, so it's only because of that that the expectation can be frustrated. It can turn out, uh, no, it wasn't Cinnabar because it didn't do the right thing. Um, Right, I mean, if if it was just an association, if every time I saw A, I saw B, and now I saw I see A, and I'm thinking B, and I don't see B, that's not a frustration of an expectation per se, right? Because again, we don't know whether this B that I'm imagining. Is going to happen later, or already happened, or is happening somewhere else, right? Um, so, but with the concept saying the reason you see B after A is because you expect this effect. Um, now, like, then it either works or it doesn't. Um, so, like, you know, how does this work? Well. I mean, so it works because time, in addition to its homogeneity, has this property of direction. And the imagination can use the fact that time goes in this direction and not the other direction to like somehow image the fact that the concept requires this order and not that order. And like the the general version of that, that is the general ability that the imagination must have is the schema of the, of the category of cause and effect, right? That is in order to form any empirical concept at all, the imagination must have the ability to take the, to, to take the time order and make it an image of the concept order. 
the, 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 the conditional order specified by the concept. So, um, um, and the highest principle of all synthetic judgment assures us that the imagination will succeed with some empirical concept, <laughs> right? So this expectation will not always be frustrated. Um, and so I think that's the, like, that's the end of the second analogy. Although obviously what Kant says is a lot more complicated. Like I said, I haven't gone into the text in detail, but I think that's what's going on here. Okay, other questions about that before I go on to phenomena and noumena? Okay. Um, I mean, I have a lot of questions about it. <laughs> Does this mean that any empirical intuition would have to have a direction? And then it starts to seem like we know something about other possible forms of sensible intuition. I think the answer I think is supposed to be no. We don't know how another form of sensible intuition would rep would image this like if then property of concepts, but it wouldn't be by direction. <laughs> um, Okay, but all right, never mind that. Okay, on to the new stuff. So phenomena and noumena. So um, so okay, so why is this here? <laughs> um, well, it starts with these two questions, which you might think should provide the answer. Um, so this is on B295, page 257 in Kim Smith. Um, right, so it's it starts with this metaphor of this island of truth that we've mapped out. And now the question is, um, and now we're about to venture out upon the sea of illusion. That is, we're going to enter the transcendental dialectic. But then Kant says, before we venture on this sea, right? So now it seems like we're getting an explanation of why we haven't gone straight to the transcendental dialectic before we venture on this sea uh, to explore it in all directions, blah, blah, blah. It will be well to begin by casting a glance upon the map of the land which we are about to leave and to inquire first whether we cannot in any case be satisfied with what it contains. are not indeed under compulsion to be satisfied, blah, blah, blah. Okay, and then um, there's the second thing. And secondly, by what title we possess even this domain and can consider ourselves as secured against all opposing claims. So it seems like he's saying, we're gonna have this section because before we start the transcendental dialectic, we have to ask, whether we can can or indeed must be content with what it contains or satisfied with what it, what, it, what it contains. And secondly, by what title we possess even this domain. But the problem with that is that it seems like the rest of the transcendental analytic has already answered those questions, <laughs> right? Isn't that what it was about? <laughs> um, so, and actually, Kant does go on immediately to say exactly that. Although we have already given a sufficient answer to these questions in the course of the analytic, a summary statement of its solutions may nevertheless help to strengthen our conviction by focusing the various considerations in their bearing on the questions now before us. So it sounds like phenomena and noumena is just going to be a summary of what we already did. Um, but first of all, it's 
especially counting the appendix, it's super long. <laughs> right? Like if it's supposed to be a summary, it's not that much of a summary. <laughs> um, I mean, I guess, yes, it is shorter than the entire transcendental analytic, but it's not like, uh, you know, what you would normally think of as a as a brief summary. Um, and then moreover, it seems to go on to discuss all kinds of other stuff that we haven't talked about so far. I mean, again, that's especially true in the appendix where he brings up this whole, there's this whole new table of the concept of reflection that we haven't heard anything about before and so forth. But I think even in the, this part, phenomena and noumena, proper, he starts talking about things we have not talked about before. So I'm not sure about this, but I've come to conclude over the years that um, there is a summary, but the summary is actually just the first two sentences of the next paragraph. And that these two questions are not actually the topic of the section. So I, um, I mean, the first two sentences of the next paragraph do definitely contain a summary of the transcendental analytic. Maybe it's more than two sentences, or maybe it's probably two sentences in the original and like five sentences in English. <laughs> German sentences can be very, very long, and Kant takes full advantage of that. Right. Um, so uh, anyway, it's just the beginning of the next paragraph, I think, is the summary. And then he goes on to raise something else. Um, So, and I think he starts raising something else on B296, page two. So it's the next page in the B edition and also the next page in Kemp Smith, 258. Um, although I think this is still not the main topic of the section, but this is the new thing he says. But although these rules of understanding are not only true a priori, but are indeed the source of all truth, that is of the agreement of our knowledge with objects, Right, we understand, you understand what he means, right? He's saying that the, um, the synthetic a priori principles um, are the, remember, they're the things that if you deny them, you're denying that you're thinking about anything that are, right? You're denying that our thought has an object. Um, so if by truth, you mean correspondence of thought with its object, then, these principles are the source of all truth, right? That is the possibility of truth rests on these principles themselves being true. All right, so anyway, but although these rules of the understanding are not only true a priori, but indeed the source of all truth, in as much as they contain in themselves the grant, oh, sorry, that's, I'll skip that, blah, blah, blah. We are not satisfied with the exposition merely of that which is true, but likewise demand that account be taken of that which we desire to know. Right, so the new question that he's bringing up, he's saying, um, uh, okay, fine, Kant, so you've proved that these synthetic a priori principles are true, but why should I care about that? <laughs> That's the question. Um, and why is that such, such a good question? Well, he goes on to say, if therefore from this critical inquiry, we learn nothing more than what in the merely empirical employment of understanding, we should in any case have practice without any such subtle inquiry, it would seem as if the advantage derived from it by no means repays the labor expended. So like, what would we, what would we have done without any such critical inquiry? I mean, I think I said this before, I think when I talked about the preface where he also asks a similar question. Um, and I, I think at the time I said, he's gonna say something more complicated about this when we get to phenomena and noumena. So here it is, right? But um, um, so like, I think what I said before was, so Kant, 
thinks Hume is right to say that we can't possibly doubt the principle of cause and effect, right? We can try to doubt it, but it won't work. Um, uh, as Hume's characters in the dialogues concerning natural religion say, you know, one of them is a big skeptic and the other one says, oh, but I know that when we're done here, you'll leave by the door and not by the window, right? Meaning like uh, you may, you can sit here and say that you don't believe in the principle of cause and effect or whatever, but, uh, but I know that as soon as we stop this argument, you'll believe in it just the way everyone else does. Um, so uh, I assume they're they're not on the first floor, so leaving by the window would be a mistake. <laughs> oh. <laughs> uh, so anyway, um, uh, so if that's true, then it seems like this big proof, right? Like it, that is, if e if even Hume agrees that we're 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 going to keep using the principle of cause and effect, and Hume himself uses it. He certainly uses it in the history of England, but he uses it even in the midst of his skeptical arguments, right? Like many of his skeptical arguments involve things about like, you know, what various events in the mind cause other events in the mind according to general laws that he would observe, right? So, um, so, so Hume is serious about this, right? Like, yes, we're gonna keep using this even though we can't show that it's legitimate or something like that. We can't show that it's rational anyway. Um, so what's the big deal? What's the point of going through all this trouble to prove it? Um, so, um, I mean, this is interesting because it's a special case of a general thing that I've been talking about in 100C with Locke's view of demonstration, right? That Locke says that every demonstration begins with doubt of the conclusion. And the point of the demonstration is to resolve the doubt. So if you already don't doubt the conclusion, the demonstration has no point according to him. Um, so Kant is, um taking the opposite position here although he doesn't argue the general case right he only talks about the specific case so um so actually i mean he actually has two answers the first answer is the reply may certainly be made that in the endeavor to extend our knowledge a meddlesome curiosity is far less injurious than the habit of always insisting before entering on any inquiries upon antecedent proof of the utility of the inquiries. An absurd demand since prior to the completion of the inquiries, we are not in a position to form the least conception of this utility, even if it were placed before our eyes, right? So, so I, I mean, Kant doesn't explicitly raise this possibility, but I think it's implicit in this sentence. It's not just that it might be useless to try to prove something that no one doubts. It might be harmful, right? Like, uh, because once you start trying to prove it, if they don't like your proof, maybe they're gonna start doubting it. Now, I mean, Hume says in this case, that can't happen, or at least Hume in one mood says that. <laughs> Uh, in another mood, he says, what was I saying? Right. But anyway, um, so, uh, um, uh, but someone else might, might be less sure of that than Hume and might be worried. Um, and um, it seems like here he's, I mean, there's certain passages where, where, Kant is almost like explicitly talking to a potential censor, right? Where he says like, if government chooses to, this is in the preface, I think, if government chooses to meddle in, in academic inquiries, then they would be more advised to worry about this than that, or right? Um, so, I mean, it's not so explicit here, but it is, I think it's like, it's aimed at that 
attitude, if not at the actual institution, perhaps, of censorship. And he's saying, like, you know, um, however harmful this meddlesome curiosity might be, it's uh, not going to be half as harmful as, ref as not letting anyone carry out an inquiry until you can see how it will be useful. Because you can never tell it'll be useful until you finish the inquiry. So um, that would just put a stop to everything. Um, so we just have to risk it, right? That's what this argument is. But then he says, almost contradicting himself, himself, he says, there is, however, one advantage which may be made comprehensible and of interest even to the most refractory and reluctant learner. So actually, there is an advantage to this inquiry, which you can see even if you like before you understand how the inquiry works. And that is the advantage that while the understanding occupied merely with its empirical employment and not reflecting upon the sources of its knowledge may indeed get along quite satisfactorily, there is yet one task to which it is not equal, that namely of determining the limits of its employment and of knowing what it is that may lie within and what it is that lies without its own proper sphere. So I think that's actually where he announces the topic <laughs> of phenomena and noumena. It's the understanding's reflection on its own. Now, I mean, this has already happened in the transcendental, in the rest of the transcendental analytic. That's what he's saying, right? The understanding has reflected on its own, uh, the sources of its own knowledge, right? That is, rather than just trying to go forward with the objects and draw new conclusions about them, that would be the dogmatic procedure. The understanding has stopped and reflected on its sources of knowledge first. Um, and Kant is saying, that's something that um, that like Hume can't supply, or that that supplies something or that is. I don't know exactly how to put this. Let's go back to Hume. Hume is trying to do that, obviously, but he does it wrong, I guess, according to Kant. <laughs> um, but anyway, uh, like that's something that Hume's outcome does not supply. Like so, and, and I think you can actually see that if you go to the passage I was alluding to in the dialogues concerning natural religion, it's like actually the whole the whole problem turns on that the the skeptical character Philo says, um, um, "Oh yeah, I agree with you about that." Right? He says, I'm not one of those extreme skeptics who thinks I can doubt everything. No, of course, in everyday life, we, you know, we go on believing what we ordinarily believe. But then he says, but look, in this case, where they're talking about proving the existence and nature of God, okay, Philo says, in this case, we've gone too far beyond our ordinary uh, experience. And he, I think he says, we are got into fairyland before we arrive at the conclusion or something like that, right? So, um, so like, and then it just turns out that between him and the other character, there's this kind of hard to negotiate question about how far is too far, right? Like how weak of an analogy is too weak? Is the, the world is kind of like a watch or a house, but not very much and, you know, Right, so, um, um, so that that is that way of going where we just say, okay, no one doubts this. Let's start using it. Doesn't yield any definite limits to the use, even though it does seem, and Hume has to. I think Hume has to agree. None of those characters necessarily speak for Hume, so it's complicated, but I think Hume has to agree, although like at some point it will be clear that we're, well, actually, I mean, I know Hume has to agree because that's exactly what happens in the course of, of the treatise, for example, that we get to principles of the imagination that Hume says, okay, but this one we should resist. Right, like this one goes too far, you know, like when he talks about how the principles of 
imagination yield uh, Aristotelian metaphysics. <laughs> so, um, 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 so he has to admit that there's some limit, but his procedure does not really allow you to say where it is. So Kant is saying, you know, like the, the kind of reflection that we've carried out has enabled us to draw a definite limit around this island that we're now leaving. Um, that was the advantage. Um, so, so I think like you can, so, so it's already happened, but we haven't already talked about reflection. We've just done it, <laughs> right? Phenomena and Numina is about reflection. And that's why there's an appendix called the, the Amphiboly of the Pure Concepts of Reflection. Um, so, so I think like the three parts of trans, so the three parts of, of general or formal logic are the doctrine of concepts, the doctrine of judgments, and the doctrine of syllogisms. Um, where a syllogism is, um, I mean, we'll talk more about that when we get to the transcendental dialectic, how Kant understands the syllogism. But it's basically like a way of showing why um, um, how the truth of a judgment is required by the subject concept using an intermediate concept, right? So like if the judgment is all A is B, then you wanna show that you, rather than just asserting this, you wanna show how A requires that this judgment be true. And how can you do that? Well, you have to find an intermediate concept This is an example of a syllogism. Can people see that? Yeah, okay. Um, all A is C, all C is B, therefore all A is B, using this intermediate concept, right? So like that's what the third part of general or formal logic would be about, the conditions that make a syllogism valid, roughly speaking. So the three parts of transcendental logic, right? So this is, general or formal logic. Transcendental logic, actually it's dangerous to abbreviate transcendental because Kant distinguishes between transcendental and transcendence. And there actually are places where Kant himself abbreviates and it's not clear which one he meant to write. Anyway, uh, so transcendental logic these two parts match up. Then what happened to the third part? So like the official answer is the third part got moved to the dialectic, right? Because Kant says there is no, there, there is no, uh, um, there are no valid transcendental syllogisms. They're all uh, fallacies, right? So they're gonna be discussed in the, um, in the dialectic. But the truth is, but this is kind of parallel. Um, only um, only the syllogism we're carrying out here, so to speak. Oh, wait, sorry. So I'm getting confused. 
these are the parts of the transcendental analytic, but I want the parts of the analytic of principles. Unitism system and then phenomena are new. Okay. But still, this is about consonants. And this is about judgments. Only so like what what we've what we arrive at in the um, analytic of principles. It's kind of it's kind of like the opposite of a syllogism. Like like this would be the syllogism. The category is the is its schema. And the schema is blah blah blah. Therefore, you know, therefore, the category is blah blah blah. But we actually show in the transcendental, in the analytic of principles, is that the category doesn't exhaust the schema. And um, right, so the category is more than the schema. And therefore, the category is more. I mean, I, I don't know what these dots are about and everything. So uh, maybe you should take this syllogistic form as a with a grain of salt. But but I guess I mean at least you can see the the difference between what happens here and what happens here. What happens here is that the category turns out to like. Um, I guess that's not the right way to put it. The schema realizes and at the same time restricts the category. Remember, that's what he said at the end of the schema thing. Establishing the schema is what establishes the limit. Right? The category is kind of like before I drew it as like this, but the truth is it's just kind of indefinite. Right, we don't have a list of possible forms of sensible intuition. Um, it has, it doesn't, there's no structure to this at all until we look at the schema we actually have, and then we have a limit. And that limit is the, the shore of the island of truth. <laughs> That's the limit we're talking about the understanding. Uh, establishing by reflecting on itself. I don't know. I'm not, I'm not sure if you buy what I've said about the relationship between this and this. And it's possible I have Hegel on the brain. And... <laughs> yeah. Um, talking about having Hegel. Yeah. <laughs> I was wondering if you could, and this could have discussed a little bit with you, if you could talk about the Kant's definition of dialectic, because I don't want to be like a case for it. Okay, so I'm going to I'm gonna talk about that when we get to the transcendental dialectic, obviously, but I'll, I'll, I'll just, yeah, I mean, the definition of dialectic is, so Kant says, strictly speaking, dialectic is the disreputable art of, like, confusing people using fallacious arguments, right? That's how he defines dialectic. But then he says, but of course, that's I'm not going to have a book part of my book that's about that. That's already too well known. Right? The, the part that he's calling the dialectic is about like the what makes those fallacious arguments, you know, seem valid and uh, and where the error is and whatever. Um, uh, so, and therefore he says, he says that general or formal logic doesn't really, strictly speaking, doesn't have a dialectic or that's at like an optional add-on because he says that um, 
the logical fallacies are not don't have this kind of strong illusory force that the transcendental fallacies do. Once someone points out the fallacy to you, you no longer feel attracted to the conclusion, is what he says. Whereas the transcendental fallacies, where you know, where the conclusion is something like either the world had a beginning in time or it didn't. No matter how much Kant explains why that's wrong, it still seems right. At least that's what Kant says, right? So anyway, yeah, that's what Kant means by dialectic. Um, I feel like Hegel already misunderstands what Kant means by dialectic, although I'm reluctant to say that. Um, but it seems like Hegel is already confused about what the word dialectic means and where it comes from um, and uses it to mean something else. But anyway, this is this course is not about Hegel, fortunately. <laughs> for, unfortunately for me, because I love Hegel, but fortunately for you. All right. Anyway. <laughs> uh, okay. So um, all right. So whether this is right or not, um, I do want to say that the phenomena pneuma is about the understanding is a reflection on itself. And specifically, it's about how the understanding's reflection on itself can, um, can uh, reveal this limit. Um, so this is actually the part of the book where Kant addresses what I think are historically speaking the two biggest objections to his theoretical philosophy. Um, one of them is what's sometimes called critique of critique. Right, where you say, uh, um, okay, Kant, what faculties are we using? So you say, well, our faculties are so on and so forth, and this is their form, and blah, blah, blah. What faculties are we using to find that out? Right? In other words, what's the status of all the pieces of knowledge, or alleged knowledge in this book? Um, and um, a lot of people like Schelling and Husserl in a completely different way have looked at this this problem and said, oh, so Kant didn't realize he actually does believe we have intellectual intuition. And this is where we see it, <laughs> right? That is that the, the self-knowledge of the ego that's involved in carrying out the critique itself requires an, a knowledge of ourselves as, as a thing in the, as a noumenon, as thing in itself. Um, but of course, Kant doesn't think that. So either he doesn't notice the problem or he must say something else about it. And I think, although I'm not sure I completely understand, I think this is this this section is where he's talking about. And the other thing is about things in themselves or numina. Right, where like um, people look at what Kant says about noumena or things in themselves, and he says, um, like, we can have no knowledge of them. Um, uh, they lie at the basis of all appearances, but we, we will never know what they are, and blah, blah, blah. And they say, hold on a second, you just said a lot of stuff about them. So we do know about them. <laughs> Right. So, or, or I guess to put it somewhat differently, that the claim that there's a certain kind of thing that we have no knowledge whatsoever of makes no sense. It's, right. It's incoherent because I just said something about it. <laughs> um, so, uh, um, and I think, like, so if you're like Schelling or Husserl and in a way, Hegel, but Hegel is much more complicated. But if you're like Schelling or Husserl and you say, like, the answer to this question is that we do have intellectual intuition, and then you'll say, and the answer to this question is that we do know things in themselves. 
I guess you could kind of put Schopenhauer here too. Well, maybe. All right. Anyway, um, so uh, so again, Kant has to say something else about it. Um, and I mean, you can combine both of these into one basic question. Like the question is, um, how can the understanding represent itself as limited if it can't represent any alternative to itself? Right, it's like all it can represent is phenomena that are objects of our form of sensibility. Then, um, how can it represent that as a limited region, so to speak, an island? Um, you just said that was all it could represent. Um, Okay, and you know, so how is that connected to phenomena and noumena? Um, so, um, I mean, um, what I'm hesitating is to start talking about the meaning of the Greek words. <laughs> um, uh, I'll just say that, you know, like this is this is from a verb that means to appear. Um, and so it roughly speaking means appearance, right? it's a, it's a passive participle, but the verb is uh, the opponent, meaning that it's passive forms are used as the hacker. so um, so this means, but but nevertheless, I think there's there's something Kant is getting out of using this participle that's actually like a little bit hard to say in English or in German that that a, a phenomenon is something that appears. <laughs> it's what appears. Um. Um. Right, so, well, the definition of it here on page B306, um, Kemp Smith, page 266. If we entitle certain objects as appearances, sensible entities, Zinnenwesen, sense beings or something like that, right? Um, and then in parentheses, phenomena. So, so, right, so a phenomenon is like the, the object we have because it, as it appears to us, because it appears to us. Now, on the other hand, noumenon, so, um, this is also, this is a passive participle, but of a regular old verb. So right, that is the active verb, knowing means to, well, to intelligize or <laughs> to understand, um, right? And it's from that comes the noun, noose, um, which is equals intellect. Uh, 
Uh, <laughs> I have a hard time saying, but anyway, so, um, that should also be written in between there. Um, so, uh, um, so like this is the verb to do whatever it is that the understanding or intellect does, <laughs> and this means that which that thing is done to. <laughs> So it's the object of understanding or intellection is what a noumenon is. It is clear that these are the plurals, right? These are the same ones. All right. Um, so when you put it that way, it should be clear that, of course, all phenomena are noumenon. Right, I mean, that is um, the object that we understand because it appears to us, or the object that we represent because it appears to us, we've, we've just been saying at great length that we're only able to do that because it's the object of a concept, right? That the um, sensations are not enough, even with the form of sensibility, the sensations are not enough. We have to have a concept, um, and the concept is an act of the understanding. That is, it's an act of knowing, right? So it's like uh, um, what any phenomenon is has to be the object of understanding. That is a noumenon. So, um, um, so Kant actually talks about people. This is on. B312, it's on page 273 in Kemp's thread. He has a whole kind of rant against people who take advantage of that to say, to distinguish the mundus sensibilis from the mundus I guess, um, right, the sensible world from the intelligible world by saying, well, by this, I mean, like, for example, what we do in astronomy, where we just observe things. And by this, I mean, like, astrophysics, right, or Newtonian mechanics, where we, like, the part that's contributed by the understanding, so to speak. And Kant says, I mean, yeah, you can use it that way, but like that's just uh, like deliberately misunderstanding what people have traditionally meant by this. Because he says what people have traditionally meant by noumena is, um, and like who traditionally, the, the ancients, like Plato especially, he's thinking of, right? So that what people have traditionally meant by this is things that are the, the object of the intellect or understanding alone without any intermediation. So that's the, going to be the distinction. Maybe I went about, um, about that longer than I had to. Um, so that's why a noumenon would be the object of an intellectual intuition or intuitive intellect, right? Because an intellectual, an intuition is intuition is an intuition is a representation an immediate representation of an object let me say that again an intuition is an immediate representation of an object so if this has to be the object of um intellection or understanding alone then obviously there's no other representation between the intellectual representation and the object and therefore it must be an intellectual intuition um so the question though is are we entitled to that concept remember we don't know that an intellectual intuition is even possible so how can we start talking about what its object would be like 
And so the answer, in at least in the main section of Phenomena and Noumena, that is the reading for today, the answer is, um, well, there's actually two different concepts of noumenon, and we're entitled to one and not the other, <laughs> right? So there's the um, negative problematic concept. And there's the positive assertoric process. And he says, we're entitled to this one and not to this one. Um, So, like, to, I think to explain what the negative one is that we're entitled to, um, so let me say something again about how an intellectual intu intuition would work. I mean, the short answer is we have no idea how it would work. <laughs> but the long answer is that it would be something like Leibniz's God. So, um, so, like, um, it would have a principle of actuality. Um, should I write all this stuff up? I'm not sure I'm going to refer back to it. Oh, well, there's only three things I might as well. <laughs> all right. So, it would have a principle. This is an intellectual intuition or intuitive intellect, maybe we should say. They're the same thing. It would have a principle. Not everyone agrees that they're the same thing, by the way. <laughs> but I'm saying they're the same thing. All right. So it would have a principle of actuality. Um, that is, it would be able to derive, we can derive from our own nature something about what might possibly be given to us but not what will actually be given to us. And uh, an intuitive intellect would have a principle of actuality by which it would derive what actually will be its object, right? And in the case of Leibniz's God, that's supposed to be the principle of sufficient reason. Um, so, Therefore, it would automatically have a way of subsuming its objects under its, so to speak, concepts. I mean, I don't think it would be right to call its representations concepts exactly, but um, that is, it wouldn't need a schematism. Why? Because the the um, essence of the objects would be derived from the concepts. <laughs> um, so uh, um, so the way of subsuming the object under the so to speak concept would be to produce the object, <laughs> um, and then. Um, Therefore, whatever it could think would be possible. Right? That is, for us, there's things we can think. They, that is, they don't involve a contradiction. But they're not possible because we have no way of subsuming an object under them. That is, we can't represent them as possible or impossible, right? We, we just can't apply the concept of possibility to them because we have no way of subsuming an object under the concept. So, um, but for this uh, intuitive intellect, whatever it could think would be possible. Um, So 
So therefore, this intuitive intellect would have um, uh, knowledge of possible and actual things, as Kant says, überhaupt und an sich selbst, right? In general and in themselves. That is, um, uh, it would know, it would have knowledge of everything that it was able to think. And it would know it as what it is, not by any of its effects or anything like that. So, okay, so all this is good, except we don't know what think means here. <laughs> and we don't know what the concepts would be. And we don't know what it could think and it couldn't think. Um, it, um, et cetera. Um, because we, so we don't know what subsumption would mean because for us, subsumption is discursive. It means having a general representation and finding something that fits it. But for this intellect, it would be some way of deriving an actual thing from its representation. And we don't know how that would happen. Um, and um, we know that the limit on what we can think is the limit on what kinds of general concepts are possible, namely the ones that don't contradict themselves. But this wouldn't have general concepts that had list of characteristics. So we don't know what would be the, cri the formal criterion of reality for its representations. Um, and that's why the concept of a noumenon has no positive concept. Right, that is, we can list its characteristics, but all we really understand by these is that it's not the way we do it. <laughs> but we don't understand how the intuitive intellect actually does it, how it could do it. So, like, um, the positive concept, as Kant says, would be of an object that, like, of an object that. Um, could possibly be the object of a sensible intuition. And to understand that, you have to understand what it takes for something to be possibly the object of, a, of an intellect. Sorry, did I say sensible intuition? I meant intellectual intuition. To understand that, you have to understand what it means for something to possibly be the object of an intellectual intuition. And we don't know, we don't know anything about that. So when we claim that, like, uh, if I say I'm thinking of a noumenon, and by that I mean I'm thinking of the possible object of an intellectual intuition, um, I'm wrong because I don't know what that means. So then, but the negative problematic one is this, we don't know that our way of representing objects is necessary. In fact, we know in a certain sense that it's not. So um, what these things are actually saying is like, we have no principle of actuality, but we can't prove that no intellect could have one, right? We need a schema to subsume things under concepts. But we can't prove that any intellect could have one, um, right? For us, there's a distinction between what can be thought and what's possible, but we can't prove that that would be true for any intellect. Um, and so the negative concept of a noumenon is um, basically just like um, an object that's not a phenomenon. <laughs> and that's why Kant says, this is on, uh, B 307 on page 268. Um, this is right after he's just explained this distinction that I just explained. Maybe I should read what he says. Maybe that'll also help. 
If by noumenon we mean a thing so far as it is not an object of our sensible intuition and so abstract from our mode of intuiting it, this is a noumenon in the negative sense of the term. But if we understand by it an object of a non-sensible intuition, we thereby presuppose a, presuppose a special mode of intuition, namely the intellectual, which is not that which we possess and of which we cannot comprehend even the possibility. This would be noumenon in the positive sense of the term, right? So that's where Kant is making the distinction I just made. And then he says, the doctrine of sensibility is likewise the doctrine of the noumenon in the negative sense. Right, because uh, again, the noumenon in negative sense really just says that uh, that uh, a noumenon wouldn't can't be the object of our form of sensibility. So everything we know about noumena in the negative sense consists in what we know about the objects of our own sensibility. That is phenomena, and just add a knot to it. <laughs> And that's what we know about the noumenon in negative sense. So this is like, um, so, I mean, that's that's a pretty strong statement of the sense in which we don't know noumena. Yeah. So in this case, would the noumena not be like equatable to a notion like the unconscious or something like that? The unconscious. Why would it be the unconscious? I don't know. Just the the phenomena noumena thing, where there's the the form of appearance, and then the noumena just you know before uh, getting this rundown. Like the immediate thought when having the phenomena in this speech of like, okay, so there's like an unconscious process that we don't have a phenomenal access to. So. Oh, I see. Hmm. I mean, the thing is, like, an unconscious process is a phenomenon, <laughs> right? I like. I mean, Kant doesn't think we can't explain how objects act on us and cause representations of us. I mean, there's something about it we can't explain. There's a question we want to ask that we can't, but, um, but you know, um, and we'll see when we get to this, when we get to the third antinomy that, uh, that, Kant doesn't think there's any exceptions to the second analogy in the case of um, us, <laughs> right? They're like everything we do, every event that happens in us has a cause that determines it to happen. And if you knew enough, you could know what that cause was. So like if there's a process that goes on in our brain, uh, before we become conscious, whatever that means exactly, of the representation, we can know everything about that process in principle. I mean, it might be really hard, but in principle, we can know everything about that process. So, um, 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 And like, this is one reason I keep saying that um, like when you ask, what is it that affects our sensibility, right? So like, so you might think of it as something like this. Um, this would be, this is actually basically Barclay and idealism, not exactly, but close enough, right? That, so something affects my mind and it, it produces something in my mind and this is the phenomenon. And so like trees, houses, mountains, whatever, 
and brains too, right, <laughs> are all uh, phenomena in my mind. And, but something causes them. And like, what is that? And they say, well, that's something really mysterious, right? Because it's not a tree or a house or a brain or anything. And then the temptation is to think this is the new man, right? The thing in itself. Um, and sometimes Kant says things that sound like this. I was about to, to head in this direction, so I'll say it now in this context. Sometimes, in some places, Kant says things that sound like this. But number one, if he really meant, means that, then there seems to be a, like a glaring inconsistency. And this is like why, part of why all those people think the doctrine of things in themselves doesn't make sense. Because, you know, what do you mean the noumenon causes this? So now you're applying the, the category of cause and effect. But this is a noumenon, you can't apply the category of cause and effect to this, right? The category of cause and effect is about phenomena. So, um, and I mean, it's worse than that, like, because you can't apply any of the categories. Like if you say, this is one thing and this is another thing, then you're applying the category of quantity. <laughs> We can't do that here either, right? So, um, um, so instead, I always say, you know, I mean, also there, there's another way of looking at it, which is something like this is the noumenon, and then the phenomenon is like the respect in which it appears to me, like it's as the aspect it shows to me, or something like that. Um, but that's basically the category of substance and accident. We can't use that here either. <laughs> okay, so what should we say? Well, what Kant actually says most of the time is, this is the phenomenon, and this is a sensation. So what's an example of this? Well, like, a piece of cinnabar. <laughs> what does it do? It acts on my sense organs and that causes a sensation. And although it's true that in transcendental philosophy, we forget all the, or ignore all the details about how that happens. They're not going away. We're not denying them. We're just abstracting from them. We're just not paying attention to them, right? So like, the way phenomena actually produce sensations in my mind is by exerting moving forces on my body. Um, but obviously we're not gonna say that in the transcendental aesthetic because in the transcendental aesthetic, we're not supposed to know anything about forces <laughs> or substances or anything, right? Let alone that there's such a thing as motion and moving force. Um, which Kant says we only know a posteriori. Um, right, so, and that's why, so if there's a subconscious, unconscious process as part of this line of causation, you know, that's, that's not mysterious and it doesn't have anything to do with noumena, the way I'm explaining it. Does that, does that, I, I think I'm answering the question you were asking. All right. Um, but so, and like in favor of this way of looking at it is, for example, this very strong statement that we have in phenomena and noumena, that the only concept we have of a noumenon is negative, right? So like that seems to totally rule out a picture like the one I drew before, where the noumenon causes the phenomenon, the phenomenon is in my mind. Right? I mean, this is not a negative concept. It's doing this. Um, if it's doing this, we know something positive about it. Um, 
Now, like I said, there are other passages in the book, and I think you've already seen some of them, and we'll see more where Kant says things that um, um, that sound like one of the other pictures. Um, so, like, I think those places can be given a good interpretation, but it's not easy, you know. So it's just, I guess, like, um, or on the other hand, people who like those places can reinterpret what he says here or say, well, he wrote that in a different period or something, right? Um, but I feel like if we have a choice between uh, like taking literally the thing that makes his view incoherent versus taking literally the thing that makes sense, <laughs> we should choose taking literally the thing that makes sense and try to figure out um, uh, what he means in the other places where it sounds like he's saying something that would make the view incoherent. Because again, like he can't really mean that noumena cause things in us. That would be completely inconsistent with what he said about cause and effect. Um, okay. Unfortunately, I went on for a long time about that, although that was I probably got to the important part, most of the important parts of what I was going to say, except all right. Um, what I didn't what I didn't explain is as best as I can understand. So how does this reflection work? Um if we don't have a special magical faculty for observing our own faculties. Um, so, um, So I think the answer is, um, that, um, we learn it as Kant says elsewhere in Socratic fashion, <laughs> right? That is, um, we learn it by trying to, uh, employ the categories without the form of sensibility and seeing that we get into tautologies or circles or self-contradictions. Um, um, and um, and from that, we learn that our intellectual uh, concepts depend for their applicability on something we can't derive from them, right? That's basically all we know here. So we, like, we know that um, we, we, we can't find any contradiction in the laws of arithmetic or geometry being false. That's maybe not exactly the right way to put it. But um, we can't find any contradiction in things not appearing in space and time the way they do. Um, but we also learn that um, we can't use our concepts without adding that thing about space and time. Um, and like, that's the act of reflection that allows us to draw the limits. Um, so, um, and that leads to a negative concept of human, right? Because that we, what we learn by doing that is that um, the limits on what we can represent are not logically necessary limits. 
that's and that's that's all that's all we learn basically <laughs> like all the talk about newman on whatever at least in the theoretical philosophy practical philosophy is different in theoretical philosophy all the talk about newman and it, it just boils down to that that the limits on what i can represent are not logically necessary limits um okay um that's all i have time for I hope that was somewhat helpful and I will see you next time.